Welcome to the circle of digital dentistry, acquisition, fabrication, and insertion. It is a webinar being presented by Kelly Bevington, RDA, EFDA, and we will begin the webinar shortly. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Kelly Bevington, Director of Intraoral Technology. Kelly began her career more than 20 years ago as an RDA, EFDA, graduating from Bryman College. She has a comprehensive knowledge of dentistry and the dental laboratory industry. Kelly has been professionally trained on most major devices, and she is able to provide expert chairside coaching. She manages the NDX clinical iOS training team and has clinically trained over a thousand dentists and their teams. Kelly enjoys sharing her knowledge by presenting webinars and as a regular contributor to dental publications. And with that, it is my honor to say, take it away, Kelly. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Great to be here this evening. Thank you for registering for the presentation. Um, I, I really look forward to your feedback on this particular presentation. It, it's a bit agnostic, right? We're not talking about a specific scanner per se, but more about digital workflows. And, and we're getting that kind of feedback and desire for interest as people are deciding about um, incorporating intraoral scanning into their practice, or maybe they're considering adding a secondary uh, scanner to their practice. So great to be here. Uh, as Jessica mentioned, you know, we've got a team of people across the country and so excited. Like I'm proud. I'm like mama proud that we've got four wonderful dental clinical professionals on our team. So there's other labs out there that might offer some aspect of training, but uh, in my experience, they're not real clinical dental professionals who have done this firsthand themselves and can share their experiences, like what happened in their hands. And that really means a lot to me. So um, I'm Kelly, right? Now we have another Kelly, Kelly Lipthrot. Kelly just joined us actually this um this past winter, and she uh, comes to us with a wealth of knowledge in not only intraoral scanning, but the adoption and integration process as well within some large groups ac across the country. Uh, Brittany Carey is also a registered dental hygienist, and she uh, services the Western uh, part of the United States. And two has uh, lots of experience with iTero and PrimeScan and, and now Trios. And then we've got Brenda Kirkin. Brenda is out of Michigan. And Brenda's a CDA RDA. She spent uh, time at University of Detroit Mercy, where she was on faculty teaching D3 and D4 students how to use scanners uh, with active patients. So not simulation labs, but real patients, uh, both with the Densply Serona products as well as Trios. And then we've got Benister Poe. Benister is... Um, trained in the Philippines. So he was a dentist in the Philippines before coming to the United States and worked with Nobel BioCare, specifically working um, with uh, complaint resolution and so forth. He's he's really great with customers and, and taking care of the patient, uh, as well as his experience as an academy trainer with Three Shape, uh, where he taught lots of people on how to use the Trios scanner. So this is our team. I'm not, the, and this is our contact information. If you want to take a screenshot or something, please uh, feel free to do that. I'm sort of going to bypass each of our uh, lengthy but professional uh, bios here, but this is all of us. And then we come into digital in general, right? And so what, what's what's the big deal, right? What's the big hoopla about going digital? Uh, years ago, I, I would say it wasn't the norm, but now it really is becoming the norm um, out of, out of um, you know, when you look at a percentage, uh, typically about 40% of our incoming cases are now digital and they continue to grow. So we're super excited about that. Um, why might you want to incorporate digit? I'm sorry, I got that backwards. It's 60% uh, of our incoming impressions are now digital for fixed work. 
And we're going to continue to see that grow uh, as people are shifting their their impressions done digitally for removable work as well. But why why go digital? Really, it it so improves and elevates that patient experience. Um, the way in which you're able to communicate to your patient is so much different when you take a digital, you know, I'll call it a wellness scan or think of it as overall new patient records. So what years ago we would have taken an alginate impression and study models for in, you know, three minutes, you can have an upper lower bite registration taken as your overall new patient records. And it allows you an opportunity to speak to your patient on a completely different level than showing them x-rays or showing them an intraoral scan of one particular tooth. That really doesn't resonate with the with most patients. They can't read radiographs. And that picture of one tooth, it's hard for them to sort of imagine exactly where that is in their mouth and why, why, why it makes a difference, what's going on. So I tell a little story, I, and I'm sure my team members that are on here are tired of hearing my little story, but I tell a story about my husband. Um, during COVID, he decided to change dentists from the dentist we have been seeing to someone that was closer and more convenient to his place of work. And in doing so, the new dentist had a scanner and they took a scan of him when he first got there, um, had a prophy done. Then the dentist comes in to do the exam. The dentist pulls up the scan of his of his oral cavity, um, tells him about some, you know, good things that are going on and about some opportunities for improvement. Um one being a, a bruxism appliance and was able to show him some of the wear facets um, that, that are going on uh, for him personally. Uh, but most importantly, or what I found to be most interesting was that he needed a crown on number 14. And the doctor starts by showing him the, the old amalgam filling um, and how there's a, a fracture, a dark line, a crack in that amalgam filling. And that every time he bites down and um, puts pressure, um, it's, you know, breaking that tooth apart slowly but surely. And so they recommended a crown and he's like, huh, you know, my old dentist has been telling me for a couple of years I needed a crown on that tooth, but it, I was just always, if it's not broke, why fix it? And uh, that's all he needed to see was the actual fracture in that tooth. And he scheduled for the crown appointment. So um, it makes a difference how, it, as a communication tool, how we discuss things with our patients. And then let's talk a little bit about accuracy. So we're a lab, right? So, and I don't have, um, you know, scientific studies. What I can share with you is that from analog impressions, typically we measure senses of accuracy by how many cases we receive back, or as we would call them, remakes. So for us, a remake is is a case that comes back for some reason, right? And our remake percentage with PVS impressions or analog impressions, it's about 5%. With the digital, it hovers right around two, like 1.8 to 2.1. So in my mind, that's half, right? Like, like it's, it's twice as accurate. Uh, and and I really, I like being able to share that with people. I have a, a quick question here. Yeah, I will address um, your question live. Thank you. And I'm going to keep going though for a moment. And so also um, think about the ease in retaking an impression, right? Many of us have needed to retake a polyvinyl impression. There's a little void, there's a bubble. Um, the, the patient shifted before the material was set. With digital, like you hit the delete button and you rescan or you erase or trim out just a particular section and you're able to rescan without perhaps rescanning the whole arch. So that's another uh, plus when uh, going to digital impressions. And so in doing that, it often saves you time 
and creates efficiencies for you to be able to see more patients, right? So it increases your, your uh, more efficient use of chair time, I guess. And then last but not least is once you do become proficient at intraoral scanning, digital scans, you're definitely going to see the savings on digital or on uh, polyvinyl impressions. You know, if, if you're looking at a PVS impression is somewhere between, oh, 20 to $40 per patient, um, that can add up pretty quickly, right? Oh. Okay, so oh, sorry about that. So I do, I do like to share the fact that um, it's not all, it's not all rosy, right? It's not all rosy and, and uh, rainbows or unicorns and rainbows. I think people say it today, it's hard for some of us, right? Like when when I first started scanning almost twenty years ago. I remember I, I shifted from a, a different position in the lab to go back and and practice clinically, right? By by doing these intraoral scanner trainings, and the first training I went to as as the attendee, I was like, "Oh my gosh, what have I done? I gave up my other job. This is really hard. It feels like I'm driving in a rearview mirror. You know, it's indirect vision, relearning indirect vision for myself all over again." So I, I like to say that uh, I'm an old dog that learned older uh, dog that learned a, a new trick. So for those people, you know, 45 and over, there might be a little stumbling block and that's OK. Right. I mean, it might take you five to 15 scans before you you feel confident and uh, and you're not perspiring as you're trying to manipulate the wand and capture the image. But I tell you, I we do a lot of trainings in dental schools and in residency programs. And the young people that grew up with hand-eye screen technology, I mean, one to five scans, like five scans and, and they're good. They're really good. Uh, their, their ability to scan quickly, dental assistants, new dental assistants who are new to dentistry that even aren't like 100% solid on their tooth surfaces or tooth numbers, really get the technology aspect of it very, very quickly. So don't, don't let that be a deterrent um, as you integrate technology, iOS technology into your practice. I'm gonna stop here for one second. What, um, I'm going to address two of these questions real quick, and and I like to do that as we're going along because it typically makes sense for whatever that subject matter was. So um, Todd is asking, what percentage of analog impressions are being scanned at the lab? And I would say probably 96%, if not a little bit more. Most all of the impressions that, uh, analog impressions that are received at the laboratory are being scanned now versus poured with stone or plaster. Um, and then I've got another one. I've noticed if we scan a crown prep with some subgingival margins, the crown will not fit as well. Uh, an open margin, what should we do? And I'm going to address that here in just a little bit live as well. Thank you for that. Kelly, we also have a, oh, maybe it went down. No, we do have a hand raise. Do you want me to take hand raises at the end or as we go along? Um, you could do it as you go along. I'm sorry, I don't see the hand raise. Okay, um, this one is for Dr. Gervasio. I asked Dr. you Gervasio. to unmute. Dr. Gervasio, I'm clicking and it's, a, it's asking you to unmute if you would like to jump in. Um, and then somebody sorry, with the was, uh, was, was a mistake. I'm so sorry for that. My apologies. No problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, and then there was a phone number, but it looks like they just rate, put their hand back down. So thank okay. you, Kelly. Sure. Sure. Okay. So what can we take digital impressions for? Right. Um, 10 years ago, I would give you a very different answer. Uh, maybe two years ago, I would give you a different answer. But today, right now, I would tell you we can take an intraoral scan for all different 
uh, all of the different restorative items that you would send an impression to a lab for. So what does that mean? Crowns, bridges, veneers, inlays and onlays. I'm personally not a huge fan of scans on inlays. It's really difficult to identify where the finish line is for an inlay. Um, implant crowns, custom abutments, uh, sleep appliances, orthodontic appliances, of course, bite splints, surgical guides, same, same sort of thing. The big one that has come up here just you know, really in the last 18 months that we're making strides, like every week there's there's another level of, of evolution and change and scan path protocol, the tweaks that, that everybody's doing. Um, and that's for the fully edentulous and partially edentulous patient. Um, and, and I'm going to get into that later in the presentation, but that's that's really been a big shift. Okay, so let's go back to talking a little bit about why you want to go digital. What's the appeal in going digital or why should you go digital? And, and that has a lot to do with what your specific needs are in your practice, right? Are you a techie kind of person, right? And you've got this beautiful, um, you know, high tech, very modern office, and you want to have like the latest and greatest impression technologies as well. So that would drive you to looking at an intraoral scanner. Um, some people are, are, you know, very much like that. Other people are really sort of more like an engineer and they want to work with the files. They are interested in exporting the files and doing some aspect of design work themselves um, or, or you know, I know in the lab, but let's face it, or there's in-office printing or in-office milling. Um, so file needs become a, an important thing to evaluate as well. And then lastly, my recommendation for that evaluation process is to have a demo, have a demonstration, whether you go somewhere and physically use the machine or you have um, a, an account representative for the scanner company come to you and they will, they're happy to. Um, I highly, highly encourage you to have a demonstration so that you are, you're holding the wand, you're feeling it, you're seeing the screen. Uh, is it a cart, right? Like it's all inclusive on wheels. Um, or is it perhaps a laptop with a separate wand uh, that is attached to the laptop? Or maybe it's a wireless technology. There's different different um, pros and cons to each of these that, that I'm going to back up here for one second, that I'll, I want to talk about a little bit. So sometimes people are resistant to the all-in-one cart. Oh, it's big. You see this wheelbase and... What's the footprint of it? And how's that really going to work in my practice? All really good things to take into consideration. Are you going to be able to get it into your operatory? I mean, I've been in some operatories in you know, New York City, for instance, that are tiny, very well equipped, very efficient, um, but be, be observant of how much space that the wheelbase is going to take to get in and out and behind your chair, perhaps the operatory patient chair. Um, oppositely, some people think, oh, well, I'm just going to get a laptop and, and, uh, the wired wand camera, and they don't really think through the process of where are they going to put the laptop, right? Where are they going to sit it? Or can you sit it on the countertop in your operatory? And will the cord of the wand actually, is it long enough to allow you to place it in the oral cavity of the patient. Um, usually it's not, I'll just tell you that. Usually it's not. So what ends up happening then is then they end up getting a cart, a separate cart to put the laptop on and all the little doodads that come with it. Not just the wand, but um, you know, there there's gonna be a base that you put the wand in. There's gonna be several different cording pieces that go together, a backup battery perhaps. 
um, and the extra ancillary items. So, so take all of that into consideration as well as the wireless options. So wireless today is much, much better than it was say five years ago when wireless first came out. The batteries, you know, were, they were tough sometimes. Um, and it's something that you have to watch on the screen. It's gonna tell you that your battery is going low. But are you really going to be paying attention to that when you're in the middle of scanning? And oftentimes people don't. So um, just a few things to, to be observant of. So we talked about, you know, <laughs> I joke, I'm Switzerland, right? When it comes to scanners, I, I truly am Switzerland. All of them have some, some feature or some aspect of them that is really awesome. And people will say, oh, well, you know, which scanner do you like the best? I wish I could cafeteria select this from that one and another feature from this scanner and sort of put it all together and build my own. I'm not that bright. I'm, I'm not smart enough uh, from an engineering aspect to, to put that all together. What I can share with you is that as a laboratory, we receive well over 3,000 scans every day from a multitude of, of scanners. And, and the short list is, is here on the screen. So, and they're in the order in which we receive them. So we receive more iTero scans than any other scan out there on the market. Um, next is gonna be Trios. Then it, it sort of goes back and forth between Medit and Prime Scan. And, um, and then the rest, you know, it, it just, they keep jockeying for position. And it really depends upon the area of the country as well. Some are just more popular in certain areas than others. And so for those of you who don't already have a scanner and you might be in the market for a scanner, I just wanted to show some, just one quick, um, a picture of what that particular device looks like. So this is the 5D from Align Technologies. It's called iTero 5D. It's their latest and greatest. This is the wheelbase I was mentioning, right? So you want to be conscious of, of spacing. But what, um, what this device, in my opinion, really has going for it is its ability to communicate very clearly and intuitively with, with your patient. Um, really nice big screen so that when the patient is sitting in the operatory chair, it's like right there beside them. So that's um, a plus in my mind. Um, with Trios, these are the variety of scanner wands, and you can see these are wireless capabilities here. With the Trios, you're looking at a laptop version, right? So it's going to be, I don't know, probably a 15-inch laptop would be my guess. But it is really important that when you you might be entertaining the thought of purchasing a scanner that has a laptop capability and it isn't sold all as one, meaning you can go out and buy your own laptop, that's fine. And many dentists think, oh, well, I'll just go out and I don't, I don't need all the bells and whistles of that particular one that they're selling. I could find one for $2,000 less. And you probably could. Make sure you pay specific attention to the mechanical specifications that the manufacturer is recommending for the laptop device. Um, all too often we go into practices and the doctor's really disappointed that their imaging isn't the same as what they experienced in a demo. And it's because the graphics card is not the highest level that it was recommended to them in purchasing that laptop. So just, just another thing that, you know, we're, we're trying to share with you experiences that we've had, right? We, we have no ownership in one particular scanner versus another. So the prime scan, another very popular um, scanner out there, really beautiful screen, right? Really nice graphics, easy to communicate with the patient's um, consider the size, right? Consider the wheelbase and how that will effectively work in your particular office. And even, you know, think of it as like wheeling it from one office to an, or one operatory to another. Medit, Medit is going to be similar to Trios um, from a, a WAN perspective, as well as um, software and hardware. And so I'm going to 
pause for a moment and check out the question and answers. I'm going to answer this one later about sending model work back. And another one about battery on an iTero. And so I, I would highly recommend uh, reaching out to support um, iTero support on that. I must say, most of the scanner companies have really good support. Um, iTero, in in my experience, is really good about sending replacement parts as needed. So if there's an issue with that, if you need their support number, I'm I'm happy to provide that as well. So we're going to get into the workflow a little bit here, and that might help to answer um, the person's question about model work. Um, so. In a traditional analog workflow, this is our workflow up here at the top, right? You're going to send the uh, PVS impression in. Um, we're going to pour the model. We're going to then 3D scan it. Typically, we're we're going to scan the impression more so than the model. Not always, but uh, we could do either. We could either scan, we could pour and scan a model, or we could scan the impression itself. And then it will go into restoration design. And uh, depending upon what, what you're prescribing will depend upon, of course, what department it might be in. And then is the actual um, milling in most cases is what we're gonna be doing. So with the milling, it's sort of cool. I don't know if you can really see the image here. I can't, no, I can't increase it. But that is what we refer to as a puck. And what happens is many different different restorations are put into the puck. So when it's milling, we might be milling, you know, 12 units at a time per puck. Uh, and then there's, <coughs> excuse me, post-processing and staining and glazing and the final quality control. Uh, as well as invoicing and shipping. Whereas with the digital workflow, we're able to save a few steps, right? We're receiving the scan itself right away. So there's nothing that we have to scan. Um, in some cases, you might be requesting model lists, right? So a model-free restoration. And the only thing we would be able to do model-free is uh, in some cases, full contour, zirconia, single unit crowns, typically in the posterior. And But outside of that, once the design occurs, we're still going to um, nest and mill it. We're still going to go through post-processing, staining and glazing, and then that final QC as well. So here's a little bit about what that file looks like, right? When it comes into the laboratory. So we're we are um, exporting the files and putting it into um, design software. So at NDX, we're predominantly using three shapes design software, and that's um, that's what we're using at all the different labs. I will tell you that it's it's very important for you to review your scanned um, impression, your digital impression, both in color as well as monochrome. Monochrome is what you would see here on the screen now. We would also call it stone model mode, but it's important for you as the clinician to be able to see the margin, not only in the color, but also in the monochrome because we, as the lab, are using the monochrome for the design. We have capability to see the, the, the color and can toggle back and forth. <clears throat> and what the monochrome does is it enhances the vis visualization of the margins themselves. 
So from the iOS portal, right, we're using the raw scan file. We're going to import it into a design software program. And in most cases, that is going to be three shape at the NDX labs. And then um, marcher marking occurs. I know that there are some systems out there that give you as uh, the clinicians the opportunity to mark your own margins. And we accept those marked margins as well. I'll also share with you that Oftentimes, uh, the the laboratory technicians who are marking the margins might call you on that, right? They they might have a concern as to whether the margin that you marked is is really accurate or not. So, when a dentist asks me, um, "Do I need to mark the margins?" Um, I sort of reframe the question. And remember, I've been in dentistry my entire adult life. So I would ask them, so if you took a polyvinyl impression, do you ask for the laboratory to pour the models and send you back the dyes um, that you want to ditch the dyes yourself? And in every now and again, I get somebody that actually says yes. So if that's the person, if they say yes, then by all means, go go forward and mark the margins because you're accustomed to doing something similar to that already. But the digital aspect of it is going to be different. You're going to need to most probably use a stylus on the screen to be able to accomplish that um, effectively. Uh, usually our, our finger touch, we're, we're just a little too fat fingered and it, it's difficult to really place the margin where you want it because then when you go to rotate the image, it's like, oh, that isn't where I want it. And, uh, and you can go back and adjust it, of course. Just a couple different images. Pop up and take a look at the question here. Sure. So somebody's asking specifically about um, itero scans and that the tissue is removed. Um, so with itero specifically, their scans can go through, they don't have to, but they can go through something called modeling and interpretation. And so that is a, um, a feature that Align Technologies offers um, in, in, in cleaning up the, the scan itself and marking the margins before it would come to the laboratory. Um, so something unique to iTero in that case. So what else um, are we doing in the iOS department at the lab? So most of our laboratory technicians are very familiar with all of the different um, iOS scanners on the market. They sort of need to be, right? Because they're they're receiving incoming scans all the time. And, and something that uh, we, we do our best to do is to educate those dental technicians, especially people that might be new to digital, in um, sort of identifying what, what a, a good digital impression looks like and how it could be made better, right? So some, some best practices, if you will. And typically that's going to be around the actual preparation and exposure of the margin for crowns. So a little bit about um, CAD design. So everything is virtually designed here. Uh, versus uh, being hand stacked porcelain or um, opaquing or something along that line. Everything is going to be done digitally. And this is one of our milling centers. And this, um, so most all of the NDX labs have some aspect of on site milling capabilities as well. We're also using, um, as far as milling, some of it is dry milling, some of it is wet milling, and we do have 3D printing capabilities specific for models, not only models, but um, also for functional try-ins and dentures as well. 
This is what I referred to earlier as a puck, the bottom circle piece here where you could get, you know, probably almost 20 single units here versus a block, which will be for an individual uh, restoration. And then after the milling, it does get stained and glazed, more similar to a traditional crown that you would be accustomed to with the final quality control. Look, one more question here. Good. Okay. So what makes a great scan or a great digital impression? I would say first and foremost is a dry field. Isolation is going to be critical. Um, this technology is not ultrasound technology yet. Hopefully in my lifetime, I think that would be great. And and I sort of joke about that. But honestly, there I've been in offices where the prep is completely submerged under saliva and blood, and the doctor doesn't understand why that scan's not good enough. It's like, I I can't see the margin. Can you see the margin? Oh, well, the lab will be able to figure it out. No, really, we can't. And and so that that's part of why we go into practices and help to educate customers um, on what, what is appropriate. So you must have a dry field. We must be able to see the margin itself um, to complete the acquisition process, right? Um, in order to expose the margin, we've got a multitude of ways to do it, but you have to be able to see the margin 360 degrees, your entire prep, 360 degrees. We've put together um, the piece that you see here on the screen, and it's specific to best practices on isolation and gingival tissue management or exposing the margin. Uh, and I'll work with Jessica to make sure that all of the attendees registered for this evening receives a copy of this as, as a handout, if you will. It's also going to address preparation style. The most important thing to remember with the preparation is all of the angles must be smooth and rounded. You don't want any kind of sharp, squared off line angles. Um, when the milling is occurring, it the it does not see into the sharp corners of those line angles. The other thing is the actual uh, prep of the margin. So a chamfer or shoulder preparation is most desirable. Uh, when I go into a practice and I'll ask the doctor, you know, what what is their go to? What's their everyday uh, preparation look like? Well, you know, they like to do a little feather feather margin, a little knife edge, just tucked subgingively. I never want to hear that. No scanner can really see that. You have to be able to see a definitive finish line for the scanner to be able to pick up that definitive finish line and for the lab to be able to fabricate a crown that's going to to fit to that finish line. So there was a question earlier about um, subgingival preparations and that they routinely see the margins coming up short. And that's that's probably why. Um, there, there might be a little um, moisture, right? Some, some fluid at the sulcus. Um, I'm very much a proponent of a, of a double cord technique. Um, but before I get to the scanning part, I really wanna make sure that I can see what I'm doing and that the area is um, clear and dry. So I'm not suggesting that you need to use any of these items with any of the scanners per se. However, when I'm working with a brand new office who's not accustomed to scanning, I really do like the Optrigate, which is in your bottom left-hand corner. It is a single-use uh, lip and cheek retractor. Oppositely, the comfort view is autoclavable. So if, if you know, being green is, is uh, super important, those are two alternatives, but it gives that new user a really nice clear view of the oral cavity, especially if they are going to be scanning full arch cases, maybe for bruxism appliances or some sort of aligner therapy. The ScanMate is a... Um, 
a singular device that is autoclavable. Um, it is black, right? So it doesn't reflect light like a, a mirror might. Um, it, there's a cost involved, right? I, I think it's a couple dollars per, again, it's autoclavable, but you could use a tongue depressor, right? And put like a finger cot on it um, to help retract the tongue. Sometimes it's very helpful when you're doing a scan, uh, let's say for a removable partial denture on the lower. The neo dries are my favorite dry angles. Um, the cotton dry angles are okay. They don't absorb as much as like the neo dries do. They they have a material in them similar to whatever's inside of a diaper, and it just like soaks up the saliva. People don't really think of um, placing the dry angle against the inside of the cheek against the parotid gland is is being like important. I I really like to do that. What I find is as I'm retracting the patient's cheek, the you're milking that gland. And then all of a sudden there's a bunch of saliva on the lower and it's like, where did all this fluid come from? And it makes it difficult to scan something. So um an item that comes up routinely for me as a question is about the different features that different scanners have to, e to evaluate occlusal reduction, right? Did you, as the dentist, did you reduce enough off the occlusal surface for the fabrication of the restoration? And so that's identified from your prescription and what material you selected. So let's just say you selected full contour zirconia. And so it's giving you 1.5 millimeter of occlusal clearance that is needed for the fabrication of the crown. There are some scanners out there that have great capabilities of assessing that and then erasing where there was not enough clearance and then giving you the opportunity to reprep and rescan just that particular area. And that's a great feature. However, sometimes the stitching, the merging together of that data, I, in my hands, I find to be a little questionable. It just doesn't look as clean and as clear and as smooth as it could be. So even though the the feature is there on the scanner, my my um, my general philosophy is let's take ten seconds and confirm that you really do have enough occlusal reduction, occlusal clearance before you ever take that digital impression or a physical impression for that matter. So this is something I like. It's called prep check. You put it over the patient's um, prep, you have them tap, tap, tap. And if it leaves a green mark, that means you don't have 1.5 millimeter of reduction there, that the green happens to be at 1.5. Um, again, there's a cost involved with it. So uh, uh, perhaps a more um, uh, cost-effective way to do it would be with a piece of wax, have the patient bite into the wax, measure the wax with calipers, um, to confirm that you have 1.5 millimeter of reduction. Or if you make your temporary before you take your impression, you could do the same thing with the temp. You know, the, the assistants know right away if there was enough occlusal reduction because they're making the temporary. And if they can see through it, there's not enough reduction there. Um, so it, just a few things. I, I do work with several, several, many doctors over the years to say, oh, you know, I use my eyes. I, I do too. I do too. But when it's, you know, a maxillary second molar, it's really hard to see that sometimes. So uh, rely on some of these easy tools to confirm that you have enough reduction. The next thing is going to be a best practice for gingival tissue retraction, right? We want apical and lateral retraction of that tissue to ensure that we can see the finish line 360 degrees and, and a well-exposed margin. So that's what this is an example of. Um, I, I'd probably smooth the, um, the, the distal of the uh, bicuspid out a little bit. Um, interproximally, but how might you achieve this? I, I mentioned earlier, I'm I'm probably a little old school. Um, I like a double cord technique where I take a double or triple cord first to the exact circumference of the prep itself. 
and place it. Then I'll follow up with maybe another double zero, maybe a number one, maybe a number two. It depends on the periodontal health of the of the tissue and how much the sulcus can really take. But it's important to, to create that retraction. Um, a good hemostatic agent is also important. I joke that I should have um, stock in Ultradent products because I really do like Ultradent products, but I don't. I can't even get samples from them because I'm not a dentist. It's, it's very sad. Uh, it, along with placing of the cord, I might use something like a comp compra cap, which is the image here in the bottom right hand corner. It, it has like a little sponge um, kind of texture to it so that when the patient bites into it, it's it's causing that pressure, right? You, you see the tissue blanch a little bit and it just helps um, pushing the, the gingival tissue out of the way. Now, I also work with lots of practices, lots of dentists that will say to me, I haven't packed cords since I was in dental school and I'm not starting now. I understand there's multiple ways to achieve the exposure of that margin. So another way to achieve that might be to use retraction paste. Retraction paste can work wonderfully. Here, here's a couple flaws or a couple things to think about with retraction paste and the best way to use it. So you want a fine enough tip so that you can express it into the sulcus. It is a hemostatic agent, but it's not there just to lay on top of the sulcus. You have to express it into the sulcus to create that lateral retraction of the gingival tissue. All too often, I work with um, dental assistants who have never been trained on how to use retraction paste, and they're just squirting it in around the tooth, and it's not getting into the sulcus. They're not having the patient bite into a compra cap or, or maybe the temporary with like a little blue mousse or something on it to help, again, push that tissue out of the way. Sometimes when the tip is fine enough to really get it into the sulcus, it's hard. It's very difficult to squeeze the trigger of, of, the, uh, of the gun. So the other option is to use one, a, a tip, a material that isn't quite a, as fine. And it can still do a good job, but I would really recommend using something like a copper cap. You could also take a cotton roll and cut it in half and have the patient bite into that as well. It doesn't work quite as well, um, but it's still pretty good. So then people will say, well, what about, what about laser? How does laser work? Laser, laser can work great. Um, retraction paste can work great. One of the flaws I see on both of them though, is the debris that can be left behind sometimes. So with paste, you wanna rinse very vigorously right before you're ready to scan. So it, it's not that you rinse the retraction paste and then you go get doctor because doctor's doing a hygiene check. Like you have to be like, boom, boom, ready to scan immediately, immediately. Um, with laser, you don't, it's not as immediate, but you still see debris sometimes that, that charred tissue. It almost looks like more like electrosurge than laser. And and since I am not a dentist and I have not used a laser myself, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the setting on the laser, the tip that was selected, the patient's tissue, you know, how hard you, you um, manipulate the tissue. But sometimes there are like little, little mountains of, of tissue that then the light of the camera has to look over top of to actually see what's going, you know, see the margin, see the prep itself. So, so be cautious of that. The one item I really don't care for at all is something that's referred to as rotary curatage. And it's, it, it is, it is a process. Um, it, it's a technique that's been used for many, many years. Um, and typically it's a flame burr that's used to go around um, the circumference of the prep and remove any, um, you know, poor, unhealthy tissue before an analog impression. And, and that can, you know, potentially work well. What happens with an intraoral scan is maintaining hemostasis after rotary curatage is really difficult. 
And oftentimes you can no longer place a cord because that that part of the sulcus has has been removed. It comes back, but for the moment it's been removed. So keep some of those things um, in mind. And so I'm going to double check my Q&A here before we go to the next part. Um, how do you dry a fully edentulous mouth? How accurate is that scan or impression? We're going to talk a little bit about fully edentulous um, cases. It can be challenging. I, I'll, I'll be very honest. It can be challenging. I'm not a huge fan of the air water syringe. I find that the air just sort of blows the saliva around and it comes swooshing right back as soon as as soon as you're ready to scan. Uh, yeah, for for a maxillary palate, I would use two by twos or two by fours to wipe over the edentulous tissues up into the vestibule and and get everything as dry as you can. The, the positive uh, with some of these edentulous scans is oftentimes it's a more geriatric geriatric patient that it, are on medications that have their oral cavity be a little dry anyway. So that's, that's a plus. The lower scan is going to be more tricky. It's, it's just going to be a little more challenging based off of the, the condition of the ridge. So if there's a lot of resorption, you're going to potentially, you know, fight with the floor of the mouth um, and the tongue to be able to get an intraoral edentulous scan. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, reference dentures and different other different types of copy dentures, you know, ways to perhaps use a patient's existing denture as a custom tray, if you will, and then and then scan that. So I've got some examples of good scans and bad scans and uh, where we could improve upon that. And then I do have some on edentulous and I'm I'm looking at the time and that might need to be our next uh, presentation. Got more information uh, than I was prepared for. So here is an example of a good scan, right? We can see really nice, clear margins. I want you to be able to see what, what a good um, monochromatic view of that looks like. All right, really nice, well-defined margins, both in color as well as in the monochromatic or stone model mode. Really nice example here. And I'm sure most of the people here, ah, oh, my scans look like that all the time. And they can, they can. Little fuzzier, right? A little bit fuzzier. Can see a tiny bit of moisture there, but it's it's still acceptable, right? So I, I don't want to just show you things that are um, perfect either. But here's a really good case where there's there's a little you know uneven tissue that is covering up the margin a little bit, and you can see it in the color, um, but it really comes through in the monochromatic and the lack of clarity that we see on, for the finish line. Well, like where, where would you design that to? Examples of missing data. So there are some systems that have like autofill um, pools on the scanner. Don't use those. I mean, really they're, they're, they're specifically there for patient presentation purposes. Meaning you don't want to show a patient an image on the screen and there'd be a hole, a missing missing data, um, because the first thing the patient will say is, oh, what is that? Is that a cavity? What is that dark blue mark? Is, it, is that, you know, is that something bad? Because it doesn't look like the rest of their teeth. So be really careful in, in not thinking that the autofill um fills in missing data for the lab. It, it really truly doesn't. 
Um, you know, we we have some capabilities to manipulate some data, but you you want to provide as much information as possible. So for this particular case, this would be um, not sufficient to move forward with the fabrication of the custom abutment and crown for that case. Same thing here. Um, anybody that ever heard, and, and I've heard it before, I haven't heard it for many years now, but I used to hear it from salespeople pretty routinely. Oh, you just need to capture one tooth mesial of the prep and one tooth distal of the prep. Well, no, you don't. I mean, what, what would you do in your traditional analog dentistry? Um, the thing that's really nice about digital is it takes, no kidding, 30 seconds more to take a full arch scan versus a quadrant. Now, single unit posterior crowns, yeah, I would do quadrants all day long. But if the patient has any type of uh, any type of bite that's off, right? If they're in a little bit of a cross bite, they're a heavy clencher, anything that isn't just spot on, um, I would do full arch scans. I, I would absolutely do full arch scans. It it takes such a small amount of upfront time to accomplish that. Here's another one with missing data or holes as we call it, right? Especially around the implant, you want to avoid that at all at all times. So the tissue has actually um, migrated over the the uh, the scan body. So a scan body is needed for digital impressions. And and part of what occurred is is they probably captured the inside of the lip there and it um, misaligned the data. So this this was a, a real case that came in for a valplast partial. And it, it's like, yeah, there's just not enough information. Continued missing data, noise or scatter, we'll call it. Um, in today's technology, a lot of the artificial intelligence has increased the, not only the accuracy, but how, how clean the, um, uh, the scans are when, when not only when they get to the lab, but what you see on the screen at the office as well. So this is a, an example of a completely unreadable margin. If somebody sees the margin there, let me know. Getting a little better. I see a question. So somebody's asking about um, sending the models back with the case. So typically we are sending articulated uh, models back. It might be only like one tooth distal of your prep and one tooth mesial of the prep and then the opposing because everything is done virtually, right? So the design is done virtually and the models that are printed are done strictly as a double check, as a, as a QC check before it goes out. And again, as I mentioned um, earlier, you do have the, we do have the capability of doing full contour zirconia restorations that are model free as well. So we're going to get into implants here a little bit. And I am running out of time here, Jessica. I'm going to quickly go through implants. And uh, I think we're going to have to revisit dentures a little bit. I'm going to keep going. So if you, if you want to stay and listen to probably another 20 minutes to get through the dentures, by all means. Um, but I want to, I want to let you know, I'm it's taking a little longer than I anticipated. So what are the key takeaways with scanning for implants? It's understanding the information that the laboratory needs. It's a little bit different than uh, taking an impression, a closed or open tray impression of an impression post. 
with implants, we need a, uh, a, an accurate scan of the scan body that correlates with the implant that's actually in the bone. And so that information can come from uh, the surgeon or periodontist that may have, have placed the implant, or perhaps you're placing it yourself. So what you need in order to place the order for a scan body is the um, implant manufacturer, um, the platform size, and the diameter size. And then, so this is a radiograph of the scan body in place. And it's really important to take that x-ray to verify for yourself, to verify that that scan body is appropriately inserted because this is the foundation. So if that implant scan body is not fully seated, your custom abutment and crown will not fit appropriately. Um, and so this, this is really important. Every scan body has uh, what we refer to as a key identifier. And that key identifier might be a bevel, it might be a divot, it might be some sort of like a little key angulation on it. Um, do your very best to place that so it's facing buckley. And then if you have multiple units in a row that you're scanning, you're going to do the key identifier buckley and then lingually, and then buckley, and then lingually. Please don't try to use the same scan body and take it from here and place it on the next tooth and then take it from there and place it on the next tooth or keep them all facing buckley. What happens is the, the, the scanners are really smart. The computers are super smart, but they're not smart enough to realize sometimes that it's a part. The scan body is an identical part. And it doesn't want to continue moving the scan forward and building that model. It tends to get stuck and, and it doesn't stitch the data together very well. 90% um, of the time, you will not be able to take the bite registration with the scan body in place. So you'll need to be prepared to take that scan body out to get uh, a quick bite registration before you put the healing abutment back in. It's too tall occlusally. The, it, it will be higher than the occlusal table. So cement retained crowns um, or screw retained crowns. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I think most everybody here knows what they are and you can scan for either one of those. So before moving into dentures, I'm going to look here. Are you able to share your slides? And can we do a setup? Can we set up a meeting with NDX to review options? Um, yes, we can do a setup. As far as sharing the slides, I'm going to refer to Jessica on that for CE purposes and so forth. Um, how about taking the bite with the HA on? I'm not sure what HA on is. Oh, healing about me. Yeah, um, you can, you can. I prefer not to. Um, I I always want you to do a pretreatment scan of the the gingival tissue without the healing abutment in place and without the scan body in place, just to give the lab the most um, accurate data of the tissue itself, especially if it's an anterior case that you've specifically sculpted that tissue to be just beautiful, beautiful papillas. Um, I, I don't want anything else in there. And sometimes that healing abutment, it, it shouldn't play a a factor in taking the bite, but I would not take the bite directly over the healing abutment. I would take it on a different area of the mouth of that, if that makes sense. Sorry, I got a couple more questions here real quick. Okay, so I answered that one and answered that one. Great. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about digital denture workflows and, and what that means. So we have something called a copy denture. Um, a copy denture would be an exact replica of what the patient has. Exactly. I I worked chair side for over 12 years um, before shifting to the lab. And I never once had a patient come in and say, I want an exact duplicate 
of this denture, but we can do that. You could scan the copy denture um, and the laboratory could fabricate a copy of that for you. Um, the reference denture is what we are seeing the most frequently used um, processing with iOS. And what the reference denture is, is using the, ex the patient's existing denture as a custom tray. So envision using the patient's existing denture, border molding it with polyvinyl siloxane, um, heavy body and light body, right? So heavy body on the border, light body on the interior and taking an impression of the, of the patient, right? Then you're gonna take the denture out and you're going to scan that. So that's what's getting it into the digital workflow. Part of the benefit of that is the patient gets to leave with their denture. Unlike the olden days where we would pour, yeah, I, I'm not in many practices anymore that are even pouring uh, models or impressions, pouring models and impressions anymore. So it's sort of interesting. Um, the immediate denture workflow, really nice success with that. So what's nice is there's some dentition there. Some of the scanners out there scan on um, topography. So the lumps and bumps, the dentition of actual teeth uh, or, or recently extracted areas then pick up very well. Uh, and then lastly is gonna be the fully edentulous workflow. The fully edentulous workflow, as I mentioned a little earlier, can be the most challenging of the of scanning the oral cavity itself without any teeth present, especially the lower. Maxillary, pr pretty good success. But if you think about it, when you are retracting the lips and cheeks with the scanner wands, you are now changing the, the, the way the muscles are folding in the vestibule. So even though you can acquire the scan, when you get that denture back, it's not going to be an exact replica of that because you've retracted the tissue. Um, that's why I like taking the impression in an existing denture and doing the reference denture process uh, because the patient's muscle has molded to the impression material. So a little bit of um, the actual workflow, right? You're going to do the intraoral scan uh, as well as all of the, the records. So you're still going to do a maxillary scan, mandibular scan, and a bite registration. Um, we then can do a CAD review. And typically, we're going to do a milled or printed functional. Typically, it's going to be a printed functional try-in. Excuse me. So the functional try-in, and I'll show you a picture of it here in a moment. Um, it's going to be all one color. It's like a B3. It, it's really nice for the patient to um, experience that. And you can go through your processes of checking their, you know, their S's and their T's and their language and and make adjustments to a midline or round off a lateral or whatever those you know specific uh, requests might be, you can do that on the uh, digital or printed try-in um, and have those corrections made for the final. So this is going to get into a lot of detail, um, more more than what some of what I've already discussed, actually. Um, and yeah, and and so if you want the the reference denture, um, the the key thing is not to modify the patient's existing denture. You want to make sure that the, and, and I've got some photos here, you want to make sure that the denture itself is intact, right? It's not broken. It's not chipped. So this is for a clinical assessment. And this, this is a good example, by the way. Right. 
great. The uh, question came up, would this be the same as a duplicate? So a copy denture would be the duplicate. That would be an exact uh, duplicate of what the patient had. So this is going to be for a reference denture. So you can see the dentition is worn, but it's still in pretty good shape. You're still going to be able to uh, get a nice bite, bite registration and use like some blue mousse material to secure the denture, the upper and lower teeth in place. Same thing here for the lower. So you still have some borders. And of course the teeth are still in place. It's important that, um, that it's covering the retromolar pads. And so this is the border molding that I mentioned a little earlier. And that can be done um, with a heavy body polyvinyl siloxane material. And you can, you can trim as needed if you need to trim anything on the, the Cameo to have, have it fit uh, back in for the bite registration as well. I thought this was a great um, tip and, and I did not do it the first time I did a uh, reference denture impression and that was to use tray adhesive on the borders really makes a difference. So here is what I mentioned about taking like bite material. You want you want something that not only can increase vertical a little bit, but that holds the upper and lower denture in place if if uh, both arches are fully edentulous. So if you look at the images, right, we've got the border molding, we've got the uh, the final impression inside of that maxillary denture, and then we have the example with the bite registration. The images to the bottom, uh, at the bottom of the screen, those are the um, printed functional try-in that I mentioned. Um, and that you can still take markings and so forth and uh, make changes as needed. The thing I like about the the functional try-in, and I don't I don't recommend telling the patient this ahead of time because we know some patients might never return, right? But at the conclusion when you're delivering your final dentures, if you want to give the patients the functional try-in and it, as a value added uh, service in as an emergency um, spare denture, you know, the, those people who go uh, cruising and so forth and they drop a denture in the sink and it fractures something along those lines that um, I, I think it's positively received. And so that really is the new try-in, this uh, new functional try-in that's uh, Printed out of all the same material, right? And it's uh, so so the wax aspect is out of the picture. Another example of what that impression inside of the dentures look like. And so you're, we we do have some uh, customized instructions on scanning the dentures themselves. And we're doing some uh, pilot programs to enable us to, to get a little more step-by-step, uh, -step, if you will, on that. So this is part of the design, the digital design in three shape, which is really pretty cool. So functional try-in, The patients seem to appreciate the, the process and shortening the, the process, usually by one to two, one to two appointments. 
Um, I'm going to check here on questions real quick. Got that one. And uh, this is something else that we get questions about somewhat frequently in regards to taking a scan for a crown under an existing partial. And I will share with you these these are the three most you know common uh, recommendations, but really reach out to your lab. What I find even you know even amongst um, the NDX labs, Different labs have some different um, favorite ways to do things. Um, my my personal favorite would be to build up the the tooth that's broken down, uh, typically with a composite material. Give it a little uh, tack with the light cure, ensuring that the clasping of the partial fits well to it and then scan that as a pretreatment scan. Every scanner out there now has some aspect of a pretreatment scan. I prefer that um, versus trying to scan the inside of the class or to scan the prep itself with the partial back in place. Appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Again, we appreciate you. Take care, take care of those patients and let us know how we can take care of you.